Hey. Hey. So I'm here today for the Atlanta Student Movement uh, Oral History Project, uh, funded by the Rich Foundation, and I'm interviewing Mr. Charles Black, who was part of the movement when it began and was at one time chairperson of the movement. So we'll start out with just telling me uh, a little bit about you, where you were born, where you went to school, and how you came to Atlanta. Okay. Uh, well, I was born in Miami, Florida. Uh, I was uh, delivered by a uh, midwife at home, so uh, that's, that, that was my actual beginning, uh, and I uh, uh, attended school there. There was no college in Miami that I could attend mm -hmm. because of race mm -hmm. at the time, so I had to leave Miami to go to college. Uh, there were colleges in the state, you know, um, uh, historically black colleges, but not in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, I was offered an early admission scholarship to Morehouse College, but I'd been elected student body president for the next year, so I declined that, and I came in 58 uh, to Morehouse. Interestingly, there was a young man who had been elected vice president of the student body, who was in 10th grade when I was at 11. Uh, he was also offered an early admission scholarship to Morehouse. He accepted his, so when I got to Morehouse, instead of his being a year behind me, he was a year ahead of me. <laughs> Very bright young man named uh, Donald Hopkins, Dr. Donald Hopkins, who was largely credited with uh, eliminating uh, smallpox and the guinea worm in the world. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so maybe if I had come on earlier, I would have been smarter and <laughs> accomplished something. <laughs> so uh, you were, uh, so I, I, I always ask this question um, because it seems to me that the universe has a way of bringing all of these people together in this one place in 1960, the brain trust of the civil rights movement in all of you. And so I, I always wanted to ask um, something about your childhood or early adolescence that gave you that sense of activism. Mm. I mean... Well, I guess uh, the most important thing about, about my upbringing was that we had a, uh, an intact family, mm -hmm. but most families were at that time when I was growing up. If you heard of somebody being from a, a broken home, let's say we call it, uh, that was an oddity. And you know, you, you looked at him like, you know, does that person look different uh, because he's from a broken home or something? I mean, it was that odd. Um, so we had a, a dad and a mom and there were four kids and we had dinner at six o'clock every day around the table, uh, beginning with a grace, of course. And, and, uh, and daddy got his pick of whatever first. Uh, but uh, my folk were also very religious, so we went to church all the time, um, all day on Sunday almost, and uh, then on Tuesday nights we had a Bible study, and Thursday night we had song practice. Um, so I was very much steeped in what was good and bad and right and wrong. Uh, I got that at church and I got that at home. Uh, and it was reinforced in the community at large because at that time, any adult could chastise any kid. And if you uh, had done something uh, that required, you know, some serious attention, they reported to your, your parents and they would chastise you on the word of that other adult. Uh, so the community really did work together as a village, as they say, yeah. uh, to raise the children. And, uh, and everybody lived in the same community. So if you were a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist, a teacher, or whatever, you lived with all those folk that you taught at school and who bought your products and put you for care. Uh, so it was, um, you know, a homogeneous community in that respect. Uh, so you were influenced by people like that, mm -hmm. and you had uh, role models to look at. Uh, so you you end up with a pretty strong sense of self, mm -hmm. and uh, and because there were no other people living in the community, you had nobody trying to lord over you as being better because of race. Uh, and, um, and for some reason, I reached a conclusion early on that, you know, people who had um, superiority complexes because of race, it didn't make sense to me because if I took the same set of facts, you know, here's somebody born into, you know, great privilege, all right, and here's somebody born with no privilege, and they both compete against each other, and the person with no privilege competes sometimes equals the accomplishment, sometimes excels. That suggests that this person has a superiority, not the one who was born with the privilege. Mm -hmm. 
So I had to fight against having a superiority complex uh, growing up. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's you know where my sense of self came from. Yeah. Uh, I was exposed to uh, discrimination, segregation, and the like because uh, you know you had the buses that were segregated, and I never forget the, the words on the signs. Uh, you had a sign that said "Colors seat from rear, whites seat from front," and what that meant was that of course if there were enough white people on there to take up all the seats, you had to stand. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I always made a point of sitting as far front as I could. I mean, that was just my little thing. I just, I'm going to sit as far toward the front as I could. Uh, and of course, the stores, the restaurants, and all that were strictly segregated. And there were only two places in downtown Miami uh, that a black person could go to a restroom. One was in the basement of the, uh, the courthouse, and the other was in the basement of a, uh, a department store called Richards. Uh, so you had to plan your activities so that you could uh, get to one of those places if you so had to go to. Two somewhere. in the whole city. In the whole downtown. The whole downtown. Miami. Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, so you know, it was that kind of thing. But uh, one thing that I found out later was that if you were as, as black as your shoes, uh, but you spoke a different language, then you could go to the hotels and the restaurants. So it was only American blacks who were not good enough to uh, take advantage of the American facilities. I wonder why that but, was. Was well, that particular to Miami? Because I think Well, I don't know. It, it, it may have existed elsewhere. Uh, but there, you know, there were a lot of Cubans uh, in Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came in all kinds of complexions, as you might know. Right. Uh, and uh, a lot of folk from the Caribbean and, mm -hmm. and uh, from all over the country right. down there. Which is why you had a different kind of vibe, for one thing, generally, in Miami. Uh, you didn't have so much uh, ugly, overt racism, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first time I ever saw a Confederate flag on display was when I arrived in Atlanta, Georgia, on the train and saw a flag displayed on the side of a building. It was a shock to me because I knew that was illegal mm -hmm. because they were outlawed after the, uh, the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why would that thing be on display like that. Wow. Uh, but that's the first time I'd ever seen one. So you didn't see that in Miami. And uh, you, you were less likely to be called the ugly words yeah. uh, down there. Many of the, uh, well, there's a, it's a large Jewish community mm -hmm. that was mostly concentrated almost entirely in, in Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were a lot of uh, what they call snowbirds, who were whites from the Northeast who had second homes mm -hmm. and, and they wintered uh, mm -hmm. in, in South Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many of the blacks had come from uh, Georgia and Alabama and places like that. Um, and uh, so you, you have less of the Dixie, you know, ingrained kind right. of, of white people around uh, that you had in some of the other places in the South. So uh, you came to Morehouse mm -hmm. in 58. Yeah, long right? before your grandparents were born. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got to Morehouse in 58, what was happening there in terms of civil rights? Well, um, it's hard to say what was happening in terms of civil rights because that was not a concept uh, that I was uh, conscious of. But what we did have was um, we had strong, intelligent uh, people around us all the time. You had Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, who was president of the school at the time, who was an elegant gentleman, who was very, very bright, and had a strong sense of uh, doing uh, uh, things to change, make the society better. Uh, you know, he wrote a book called Born to Rebel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we heard from him once a week in, in assembly. But we also had people coming in from around the country who would speak to us, uh, folk who were alums of Morehouse, like Howard Thurman and the like, but also uh, uh, Linus Salt, who did the Salt vac vaccine, mm -hmm. people like that. Uh, Masters and Johnson, the sex uh, expert people. And, you know, um, the guy that wrote the book, Proud to be Loved Country, about South Africa. Oh, yeah. Um, whose name uh, I'm, I'm missing at the moment. But so we, we had people to come. We had assembly every day. If you lived on campus, that meant six days a week because you had to go on, on Sunday for Vespers. Mm -hmm. um, but all students were required to be there at assembly every morning. Uh, so we would have all these great speakers there. And, and uh, student leaders, you know, uh, doing presentations of various kinds and the like. So you had that kind of influence around you all the time. 
Uh, but also we came to learn of some of the things that had happened in Atlanta uh, by the generations preceding us. Um, of course, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was at Atlanta University mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the folk of his generation mm -hmm. uh, who had been there. Um, but um, the NACP, for example, refused John Calhoun, who was the secretary of the branch at the time, and he refused to give the, uh, the state government the membership roles of uh, the NACP. They wanted you know, that so they could persecute people. And he had to go to jail for that. But also that generation before us had had some, uh, some pro bus protests mm -hmm. and all that we, we had known about. Uh, also, they had organized uh, what they call the Atlanta Negro Voters League in Atlanta. And uh, they had a Republican and a Democrat co-chair. And they had organized all of the black communities down to the block level. So they had block captains and they had ward leaders. Um, and um, so that at election time, they would have mass meetings and, and people would come by the hundreds. And uh, they would hear from all the, all the candidates who were running for office. And, and uh, during this time, it was all white, male, Anglo-Saxon Protestants only. Mm -hmm. No females, no Jews, no Hispanics, no, you know, no women. You know, that's what it was. So they, they talked about choosing from the lesser of the evils. Uh, so they would have all these folks to come in and make their presentations. And uh, the day before the election, the Atlanta Negro Voters League would, would put out what they called the ticket. And it was an endorsement slate of those people for all the different offices. And they were distributed throughout the whole community, down to the block level. And people pretty much voted in a block, BLOC, yeah. uh, for the candidates recommended by uh, the Atlanta Negro Voters League. Uh, so you had that kind of thing going on. So we were, we were conscious of that. Uh, but we didn't have a real sense, I didn't, of the shoulders on which we stood at the time our movement began. Um, a lot of the things I just told you about, I, I was not aware of then. I uh, came to know uh, later. Um, so, you know, it was like we were the first to ever do this, <laughs> you know, in the minds of some of us. Mm -hmm. But um, we had support from a lot of people who were of the generation between us and what was called the Black Establishment. Uh, and they, we were given various kinds of names, the Old Guard, uh, the Young Turks, mm -hmm. and the Militants, we were called. Mm -hmm. Why Militants? I don't know. We have no guns. <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, so the, the, the generation between us and the older folk were more in support of us than most of the older people. Mm -hmm. And it was partly because we were actually an instrument for them to unseat those guys, you know, with, uh, with leadership and power. That's right. Uh, didn't occur to me at the time, but that's largely what that was all about. And Leroy Johnson was one of the young Turks, right? Yes, he was. Uh, Leroy Johnson became the first uh, mm -hmm. black elected to a state legislature in the, yep. uh, in the South since Reconstruction. Yep. Uh, he, Jesse Hill, became head of the uh, Atlanta Life Insurance yep. Company. A uh, guy named Johnny Johnson. Um, Donald Hollowell, yep. who was our attorney. And, uh, and uh, you know, people of that. Oh, and Carl Holman. Young yes. Carl Holman, one marvelous gentleman who was a professor at Clark College. That's before it was Clark Atlanta University. Now, I had the highest regard for him because he had the capacity for making the best argument on both sides of any question. He would totally convince you of this position, and then he would say, like, but on the other hand, <laughs> and then he would totally convince you on the other side. Uh, I've never seen anybody before or since who could do that as well. Uh, so, you know, I was very much impressed with Carl Holman. Uh, he later became head of a, uh, a national organization called the, uh, the National, it wasn't a National Urban League, but something, with a similar kind of a name, uh, but a very, very bright gentleman. So he, you know, he, were, he was among the advisors that we had, as was Q.V. Q. Williamson, who was the first black elected to the Board of Aldermen, which later became the City Council for the City of Atlanta. Right. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when he was running for office, I took over his responsibility uh, as a captain of that ward, the third ward, you know, for organizing purposes and the like. But he was one of our advisors. Uh, an interesting sidebar about uh, QV was uh, he, he had been in the Army and he taught typing in the Army because he could type a hundred and some words per minute. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know why that came to mind, but he was a real estate uh, broker uh -huh. 
and uh, was was uh, successful with that. But was one of our advisors uh, that we trusted. Mm -hmm. uh, so that again was the uh, the generational kind of a right. atmosphere that we were living in. And I know that um, M. Carl Holman was mm -hmm. a particular mentor to Lonnie mm -hmm. King. Yes. And so I wanted to talk. I mm -hmm. wanted you to tell us mm -hmm. about when you met Lonnie and how that happened. I know you. Uh, I, you know. I know that. I know that everything popped in March of 1960. But yes. certainly there was a backstory mm -hmm. before then. Yes. Right? Well, of course, it was in in February that the uh, the mm -hmm. four guys in, uh, yes. in Greensboro did the sit-in right. there. Um, and of course, we were all pretty frustrated about the circumstances uh, as related to race and segregation and all that. Um, but you need to remember too that we were the the children of the generation that went to war mm -hmm. to make the world safe for democracy. Okay, uh, the generation that uh, Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. Mm -hmm. We were their children and their ne nephews and nieces and the like. And we knew that many of those folk who had uh, sacrificed their lives and their possible lives um, had come back to be mistreated badly, uh, to be called niggers while wearing their uniforms. Some had even been uh, and murdered while murdered, they were wearing their uniforms. Murdered while in uniform and all that. So um, we weren't all too happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it, uh, we, had, we come from a generation that was just imbued with lynchings and all. Mm -hmm. Uh, which had a lot to do with the beginning of the NACP in the first place. They would post the number of people who had been lynched that week or on big signs outside the headquarters of New York. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we were that next generation. Mm -hmm. So we were ready for doing something to make things different. Yeah. And uh, we were not interested in continued evolutionary change, which was being achieved through the courts, the NACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, mm -hmm. called the Inc. Fund. Um, and so when this example came along from North Carolina, that was like a light bulb going on, hey, you know, this is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Lonnie King was the first one to uh, see that flashlight burning. And so he, uh, he rounded up some of us on campus, and I remember specifically the moment and spot where it happened with me. Uh, I was walking uh, past um, uh, Sales Hall Annex, going uh, toward the quadrangle where the clock tower is and all that. And he was coming the other direction. He stopped me and, uh, and, and, and talked to me about, about this bit. He knew who I was because I was on the, uh, uh, the, the newspaper staff and I was on the debate team and all that. And I knew who he was because he was an outstanding football player. Uh, so, um, you know, that was our, our connection there. Uh, and he asked that um, those of us he, that he contacted come to this meeting at Sail Hall Annex that night. Uh, it was a little one-story building uh, on campus. And it all began, it began with him and um, Julian Bond and Joe Pierce uh, having a conversation in what was Jates and Milton Drugstore mm -hmm. in the corner of what was Fair and Chestnut, now Atlanta Student Movement Boulevard yeah. and Brawley. Yep. Uh, and um, Lonnie, had gone, Lonnie had known uh, Joe Pierce, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and they had a little chat first, and, and Lonnie uh, mentioned Julian Bond across the room, who he knew to be uh, a bright guy because he had met him waiting in the registration line, and they talked for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so he suggested they go over and talk to Julian. So the three of them talked about this business and uh, what had happened in Greensboro. And uh, Lonnie was saying that, uh, you know, same thing needs, needs to happen here. And Julian's response was, I'm sure that, you know, somebody would. Uh, We'll do it here and Lonnie said, No, how about us? <laughs> you know, and Jerry's response like, uh, what do you mean us? <laughs> but anyhow, that was the beginning of it all. And they, and they agreed to talk to all the people who were there yep. in the uh, Yates and Milton drugstore. They had little booths, you know, and soda fountain kind of thing, you get your milkshakes and, and donuts, whatever. Uh, so it, it began with that, and they spread out apparently and, and went to uh, various people around campuses. So the group of us that met that evening was somewhere between 18 and 24 maybe, um, mostly Morehouse guys. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there may have been a couple of ladies from, from Spelman, maybe somebody from Clark, but it was mostly Morehouse guys. Yeah. And uh, so Lonnie laid out this whole scheme about doing this, this thing here and asked that anybody who was not you know, for doing this 
That's fine. Just go about your business, but don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that. Well, of course, somebody did tell somebody. And the, uh, the, the presidents of the colleges uh, heard about this thing we were talking about doing. So they called a bunch of us in uh, to talk to us about that. I remember being in that, in that meeting. And uh, most of the presidents were opposed to our doing it. Uh, and their, their, their reasoning, of course, was that we were there to learn and all that. And they were concerned about our safety. Sure. And their obligation to their their donors for the for the schools and to our parents, mm -hmm. and all that. So they felt, and it was incumbent upon them to dissuade us from doing this thing, and to let the NACP, you know, handle it as they had in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, one of the presidents uh, finally spoke up, and I think it was um, uh, President Cunningham from Mars Brown, who said that you know he agreed with the students, you know, and uh, so things began to change a little bit. They kind of caucused a little bit. And, and then the uh, president of Atlanta University, um, uh, President Clement, mm -hmm. um, suggested that, it, well, if you're going to do this thing, you ought to let the city know what you're doing and why you're doing it, you know, why you're doing what you're going to do. And, uh, and suggested that we produce a document that spelled that stuff out and that would get it published for us. Um, so that was the, uh, the birth of the an Appeal for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and a little committee was appointed to do it. Uh, it was uh, uh, Rosalind Pope, myself, Julian Bond, Mars Stewart, I think Albert Brinson, and maybe one of the two other people. Well, our, our cell phones weren't working very well in those days. <laughs> Can I say it was? What's that say? There were no cell phones. <laughs> uh, so apparently, uh, Rosalind had difficulty. Rosalind had difficulty reaching people or whatever. But she called Lonnie and told him, you know, nobody's met with me on this thing. So Lonnie says, her, write the damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so she did. Uh, write the document. And there, there was a document that had been published by the Young Turks, um, an organization they had called uh, ACA, which was the Atlanta Committee for Cooperative Action. And they had published a document called A Second Look. Mm -hmm. And it spelled out statistically uh, some of the differentials in, in, in Atlanta racially right. that existed. And she was able to draw upon that for some factual information. Uh, but she produced this manifesto, uh, which spelled out all the areas of uh, dissatisfaction uh, that we had, including uh, law enforcement, education, public accommodations, transfer, everything. Right. And it became a blueprint for our, for our movement. And this document was published in uh, uh, the Atlanta Journal and the Atlanta Constitution, which were separate papers, the Constitution in the morning and Journal in the evening, as full-page ads. Uh, the, the presidents round up the money to pay for them. And uh, it was published also in the Atlanta Daily World, but uh, that was a black newspaper uh, run by a very conservative black guy named um, C.A. Scott, who insisted on being paid in advance for that. He was opposed to our movement. Uh, so it appeared in all these newspapers, and it was uh, picked up by the New York Times and published free of charge in a full, as a full page ad. It was also published in California, I think the LA Times or some such thing. And it was led into the read into the congressional record by Senator Jacob Javits of New York. Uh, so it is, in fact, a historical document. Uh, that is there for all times. Uh, the, the governor of Georgia, Ernest Vandiver, uh, responded to this document by saying that there's no way that any student in the state of Georgia could have written this document. And as a matter of fact, it was most likely written in, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was an indictment of education in the state of Georgia. He didn't sure. say any black student. No, any student in the it. state could have mm -hmm. written this document. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And that, you know, that exists on tape, you know, yeah. on TV saying that. Yeah. Um, so uh, in any event, uh, we published that a week before we, we had our, our first sit-ins, mm -hmm. uh, which took place at 11 o'clock on March 15, 1960, mm -hmm. at 11 different locations. Right. Uh, and uh, it was very uh, strategically planned, with, down to the minutest detail, as, uh, as Gwen had, had, had attested in her interview with you, um, uh, everybody knew what was expected of them and also knew what to expect uh, as, as possibilities. You might be beaten, mm -hmm. uh, you might be, uh, you might be killed, you know, you might be arrested, any number of things could happen. And, um, and we suggested that if you, you had three options that everybody had, that if you were given the opportunity to leave and you want to leave and not be arrested, you can take that opportunity and leave. Okay. Uh, if you are 
uh, arrested, but don't want to stay in jail, want to be bonded out as soon as possible, that's another option available to you. If you're willing to go to jail and stay in jail, that's the third option that you have. Uh, so everybody understood that. And we were uh, on our best behavior, you know, we had our decorum in place. Uh, and there were, I guess, maybe a couple hundred of us that were involved in that, that effort that day. The thing that was significant, of course, is that um, in addition to the people who actually went into these facilities and sat down, uh, there were others who were stationed nearby at a thing called a phone booth that doesn't exist anymore, who could see what was happening and call to the office to report if there was a problem. Uh, there were also people who provided transportation for these people mm -hmm. uh, down there. Um, but we also had, thanks to the Young Turks, we had people uh, who were standing by to provide bail to get us out of jail. So all of this was, was planned uh, uh, very carefully. Um, and um, so at, at, at when the moment came, it was a total surprise to the general public, uh, including to the powers that be, the mayor's office, the police and all that. Um, so the police didn't know what to do because they kept getting calls that, you know, we got them over here, we got them over here and all that. So they're waiting for orders from on high as to what to do. And uh, the decision had been made that they would uh, tell us that we were trespassing, they would give us five minutes to leave, and if we were not, would not leave, they would arrest us. Uh, so they would read that out to, to everybody. Um, the place that I went was the terminal train station, which was my very first stop in, in, in Atlanta. That's, I came from Miami on the train station, uh, on, the, on the train, and, I, and, and came to the terminal train station. And A.B. Williams King, uh, Martin King's brother, and I led uh, separate groups into two different entrances, into the white waiting room of the, uh, mm -hmm. the train station. Mm -hmm. And um, we were arrested and put in the dirty jail downtown. Uh, we were sentenced to uh, 10 days in, in, in the state, I mean, the city farm mm -hmm. uh, for this terrible deed that we had done. And so we were transported out to the, the city farm and uh, that included ladies and guys who, who were arrested. It was a work farm, right? It was a work farm. Work uh, farm. We were awakened at 4.30 in the mornings and we had to shop weeds from collard greens growing out in the field and the girls had to peel potatoes uh, and we would see them sitting on the the uh, ground, whatever, outside the place where we were leaving to go to the fields. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the, uh, the fun thing we had. Um, we were only in for four days because it was a great outcry in the city and they, um, they you know, left us out of jail. One of the funny things I, I remember when we were being arrested, there was um, a guy who was very fair skinned in, in, in a group. His last name was Ashmore, I can't remember his, uh, his first name, he had a sister named Ann. And so the, uh, the sergeant who was fingerprinting us, processing us in, uh, would ask us, you know, your name and, and uh, where you're from and your address and all that sort of thing, and rest your race. And, uh, and he, he's, he's looking at this guy's like the fingers and he, and he says, Negro. So the sergeant stopped and he looked at his fingers and he looked up at him. And he had blue eyes and blonde hair and very fair skin. He said, you're a Negro. Yeah, Negro. So he stopped and he uh, said, Lieutenant, we got this boy here, got blue eyes and blonde hair, says he's a Negro, what should I put on you? And the Lieutenant thought for a minute and he said, uh, well, put blue eyes, blonde hair, Negro. <laughs> that's why they put me out a big kick out of that, we all laugh. Uh, wow. uh, so you had to find some levity in these of situations course. where you could, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So 1960, so, so after March of after the big after after the, after the first big sit in in March, mm -hmm. there was also um, uh, right before the presidential election the sit in at Riches, right? And a lot of people know about that sit in, but they don't know how it changed the trajectory of our entire country. That's a little known story, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. Uh, to give you some backstory, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, had an agreement with his, his, his family that he would not be involved, and the established black community, mm -hmm. the old guard, mm -hmm. that he would not get involved in civil rights in Atlanta. You know, Albany, you know, Montgomery, and all those other things, that's fine, but we got this, was their attitude. And he agreed to that. 
Uh, well, it happened that on one day he was driving an automobile that had a Georgia license plate on it, but he still had an Alabama driver's license. Uh, and he was stopped. And that was not the reason, because they didn't know what kind of license he had. There was a white female riding in the front seat with him, Lillian Smith, uh, forbidden fruit. <coughs> um, so in any event, uh, he was arrested and, and uh, taken to trial. I was in the court at the time. He um, uh, was tried in the old Decatur, DeKalb County Courthouse in downtown Decatur. And the judge, <coughs> excuse me, the judge sat sideways on the bench. Let me pause for a refresher here. Mm -hmm. Talk too much, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the judge sat sideways on the bench while the the, uh, the de defense was presenting its case. Yeah. Again, it was attorney uh, Donald Hollowell. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was a big guy with big hands and big feet and a big voice. And he would always say, but your honor, I submit to you, is such and such the case. Well, the judge was sitting sideways on the bench with a comic book, <clears throat> totally ignoring Hollowell, mm -hmm. until Hollowell was finished with his presentation, and the judge turned and said, you finished? Hollowell said, yes. With his gavel, he said, <clears throat> four months in jail. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> four months in prison. Yeah. So, but he probated the sentence. Mm -hmm. All right, come October of 1960, Lonnie King convinces Martin to come down to Riches and be arrested. Uh, that was because our boycott that had begun back in March mm -hmm. was kind of lagging a little bit and some people were wanting to go back to the stores and all. Martin uh, objected, of course, and uh, Lonnie finally used uh, one of King's father's quotes on him mm -hmm. from a sermon. Now, Lonnie was a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church. He was not related to the Kings, uh, but he, uh, he was a member of that church since he was eight years old. So he knew Martin as ML, and Martin knew him as, as uh, LC, Lonnie Cecil. Mm -hmm. uh, so he said to him, uh, Martin, you know, you can't lead from behind. And mm -hmm. uh, that got ML's attention, mm -hmm. and he agreed to go and to be arrested. Uh, Lonnie tells me that he had a proviso that if he was going to be arrested, that should be some pretty ladies from Spelman arrested mm -hmm. with him. So you'll see a photograph that has Marilyn Price and another lady in, in the photo with him when they are uh, arrested. Uh, interestingly, when you see them in that photo, there are no handcuffs on them. You can't tell really what is happening. They're just walking down the sidewalk. But they were at that point already under arrest. Um, so this arrest violated King's probation. Uh, so he was uh, sentenced to, you know, serve the four months at the state prison uh, because of that. All right, so he was arrested and was uh, sent in the dark of night uh, to uh, Reesville uh, prison, uh, Penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And he was transported in the back of a paddy wagon uh, with a German Shepherd dog. And Martin uh, said that that was the most afraid he'd ever been in his life. Uh, so this event made international news. Mm -hmm. You know, King was already extremely well known. Mm -hmm. And this was in the midst of the presidential election of 1960 of uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Nixon was leading, uh, it's like two weeks before the election, mm -hmm. Nixon was leading by double digits all over the country. And um, so this matter came to his campaign's attention and to the attention of the campaign of Kennedy. And while the Nixon people were trying to decide, you know, what if anything they should do, uh, Bobby, I think, convinced his brother, uh, along with, uh, there was a black guy whose name I don't remember, who was part of their campaign, was a part of that decision, uh, that they should intercede in some way. And so Bobby ends up calling the judge uh, down here, which was probably not technically appropriate, I don't know. Uh, but the judge, uh, uh, they let him out of jail, they let uh, King out of jail. 
All right, now Danny King has said prior to this time, I don't know if I can support a Catholic for president. Uh, you know, he's Baptist and all that. So in any event, uh, when this happened and King was let out of jail, it was a big deal, and the Kennedy campaign took full advantage of it, and they published uh, something called the Blue Bomb, mm -hmm. a copy of which we have here. Yes. Uh, and it's, it was called the Blue Bomb because it was printed on blue paper, mm -hmm. and it was distributed in all major cities across the country that had large black populations. Right. And this document tells about the case of Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. uh, about that arrest and the Kennedys' uh, intervention to get him out of jail. And it has quotes in here mm -hmm. from uh, Mrs. King, mm -hmm. from Daddy King, from Ralph Abernathy, from Martin King Jr., uh, from Dr. Uh, Garnet Taylor, uh, and, you know, all uh, praising this decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this document was distributed in black communities everywhere. And as a result, uh, the black vote changed from Republican to Democrat for the first time since FDR, mm -hmm. perhaps, um, and, uh, and uh, Kennedy won the election by less than one vote per precinct mm -hmm. nationwide. So anybody who said my vote doesn't count, one vote per it precinct counts. nationwide. <laughs> yep. And uh, this, this document mm -hmm. is credited with making that difference. A little known little fact of history. And so when you when you kind of take that back to that day, the sit-in led by the students from AU Center yeah. is what caused this entire thing to to be in motion. That's correct. Changed the history of the That's world. Right. Of the world, absolutely. Now there is a uh, huge mosaic. Uh, in the Sam Nunn building commemorating that moment. It has a picture of uh, Lonnie King, Marilyn Price, and, uh, and, and, and uh, ML uh, walking down the sidewalk, uh, no rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a huge uh, mural, like a couple of stories tall. It really it's is. It's very impactful, it yeah. Really, it really is. Yeah. And it said the mural is actually of uh, the photograph that appeared in the newspapers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, you mentioned to me earlier that um, you took over chair of the movement when Lonnie graduated, right? Um, and you had several experiences in your role um, as the, the chairman of the student movement. And I wanted, if you would, just to talk about some of those, uh, particularly the Atlanta Inquirer um, and the Broadcast Coalition. All right, those things came uh, after our, our movement. Uh, but uh, while I was chairman of the movement, one interesting thing that happened, uh, somebody decided to um, give Martin King Jr. a job in Morehouse College teaching a class. Mm -hmm. uh, civil rights activism doesn't really pay. You know? <laughs> uh, so Martin needed money, so uh, they hired him to teach his class at Morehouse. Uh, it was a seminar in, in a modern social philosophy. And they rounded up some students for this class. I was one of them. There were only eight students in this, this class. It was the only class that Martin King ever taught. Uh, so this was while I was, I was chairman of the movement. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, during the time that Lonnie was chairman, one of the things that we had uh, started was a, uh, a protest of the theaters, mm -hmm. uh, movie houses and, and, and all around town. And, uh, and, and Lonnie had sent a letter of ultimatum to them. We had already begun picketing and, 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 and the like. And we had uh, white people buying tickets and giving the black folk to try to go in and, and the like. And we had a circular ticket line so if one one's refused to go back to the back of the line, it just frustrated them. Uh, and so Lonnie had sent this ultimatum letter that if you haven't desegregated by X point in time, you know, we're going to close you down kind of thing. Um, so I couldn't find that letter anywhere. You know, we didn't have our computers and mm -hmm. stuff of the like. We had mimeograph machines, which nobody knows what that is anymore, and things put in folders and file cabinets. Well, I couldn't find that letter, but anyhow, uh, we continued the protests and all, and we were getting into a rainy period for some reason, so we had our signs laminated. And um, so by this time I had established a relationship with um, a delightful lady named Helen Bullock. Helen Bullock was executive secretary for Mayor Hartsfield, Mayor Ivan Allen, and Sam Marcel. All right, and uh, she was a very matronly lady, smoked seven cigarettes with the ash hanging a little one. 
Uh, and uh, so I called Helen and told her that uh, we were getting set for the long haul with this protest of the theaters. And, uh, and so she could see if the, she could get the mayor to get these guys into a negotiating session. And she said, give me a week to see, see what I can do. So I report back to the students and they said, a week? I said, yeah, a week. <laughs> you know. uh, so the mayor does get these people to come to uh, a meeting. There were eight of them who owned all the theaters, not, not together, but you know, individually owned all the theaters in Metro Atlanta, movie houses and everything, and, and the person who was uh, uh, in charge of the Fox. You know. So they came to this meeting, we were in the uh, boardroom of the downtown library, and um, at the meeting I had uh, uh, two or three students with me and a couple of adults, Sam, Reverend Sam Williams, Dr. Sam Williams was one of them, Eliza Pascal, a white female supporter was one, uh, another, and uh, then all the guys from the theaters were on that side of the table. And at the head of the table, we had three people. There was a mayor, Hartsfield, in the center. To his right was a guy named Richard Rich. Uh, to his left was the chief of police, Herbert Jenkins. Mm -hmm. All right, now Richard Rich, Rich's department store, back up a little bit, Rich's department store had become our main target during our movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember we sat in 11 different places, which were uh, in state facilities, county facilities, city facilities, and um, five and dime kinds of locations, and department stores. Uh, <clears throat> and when we were short on manpower, uh, we had resolved that if we had only enough people to do one place, it would be Riches. And that was because Riches was everybody's favorite department store. Mm -hmm. And for good reason. Uh, they had a stated policy that no sale is ever complete until the customer is satisfied which literally meant that if you bought something today from Riches, and 10 years from now, 15 years from now, it didn't work anymore, or you didn't like it anymore, you didn't want it anymore, you could bring it back, and they would either exchange it or refund your money. Wow. So everybody loved Riches, right? Riches also had uh, the big Christmas tree at the top of the bridges and all, and that is great concert every Christmas, and, and they had uh, the Pink Pig, Mm -hmm. which was a little train thing yeah. on the monorail at the top of Riches. You went around the tree at Christmas time. They had live reindeer in cages up there. They had a secret shop where you could take your kids and leave them for a couple hours with a list of who they got to buy gifts for and how much money they could spend. And you could go shop for the kids. I love the secret shop. So anyhow, for all these good reasons, everybody loved Riches. So the boycott lasted for a year. And uh, Richards lost $10 million over the Christmas holidays alone. That got their attention. And so it was really at that impetus that they agreed to negotiate the desegregation of facilities downtown. All right, so come theater time, there's Richard Rich at the table. So when these guys were saying over there, well, all these terrible things are going to happen, somebody's going to yell fire in, in the theater, somebody's going to throw a stink bomb, and blah, 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 and there's going to be rioting. And, and Mr. Richards was able to say, uh, you know, none of that stuff happened in my store. And I wish I had not lost all that money, you know, out of fear. Or else I wish I had desegregated at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we had that going for us. And then uh, I'm saying, uh, you know, I'm sure that Chief Jenkins had maintained law and order in Atlanta. Can't you, Chief? Chief responds in the affirmative. All right. So that diffused on that. But what really diffused the, the matter at the beginning of the meeting, they're complaining about this ultimatum letter they'd gotten. Mm -hmm. And so I responded with, uh, okay, forget about the ultimatum, all right? So you don't ever want to desegregate your theaters, right? They said, that's right. And then we think they should have been desegregated all along. So we got a lot of room to negotiate. So that was the beginning of the meeting. And uh, they had all said they had, they had some parents to go. They had no stay for 15 minutes, 20 minutes and a lot. Kept them there for four hours. And we actually desegregated the theaters in that meeting. And uh, the desegregation started with the Fox Theater. And you heard uh, Gwen uh, mm -hmm. talk about um, how the Fox was. Blacks could go to the Fox, uh, but they had to sit in the balcony. Mm -hmm. And you bought your tickets at the same box office on the front, but you had to come out from there and walk up like four or five flights of steps on the outside of the building to get into the balcony. Uh, and so it was segregated. Other theaters, you couldn't go at all, mm -hmm. all right? except for black theaters in the black community. So anyhow, uh, the agreement was that uh, desegregation would, would begin with the Fox and the coming of the Metropolitan Opera Chorus, 
okay? And um, there were no tickets available because this thing had been, you know, grandfathered for years and years mm -hmm. in the white community. So we had to get some whites to agree to give up their tickets to blacks who could afford them. So there, you know, maybe eight or 10 or 12, uh, uh, you know, blacks, uh, you know, couples, mm -hmm. uh, maybe five or six couples uh, went and nothing happened. You know, the world didn't come to an end, you know, the fox didn't fall down to the ground, none of that stuff. And so it, uh, upon that, we had, we had a, a date after that, that we would, um, at, a, at a certain hour of the day, on a particular day, we would have X number of students to go to each of these theaters. And uh, so at that time, and it kind of came, um, it may have been around exam time, I'm not sure, but uh, we were having some trouble lining up enough students to go, and transportation was also sure. an issue because I think there were two cars on the Morehouse campus. Um, so anyhow, I'm getting phone calls from owners saying, where are my people? <laughs> you know, the theater owners want to know where are their people. Yeah. Uh, so that was a part of levity, but uh, we did get enough people to all these theaters and, and things went well. Didn't have any press conference or anything about it. You know, it just happened and people just started going. Uh, and that's how the theater desegregation took place. But also during that summer, you know, with the upcoming presidential election and all that sort of thing, we had a massive uh, voter registration campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was an organization put together called the All Citizens Voter Registration Committee, headed by Jesse Hill. And the students provided a lot of the manpower for that effort. So we went door to door all over town uh, and putting out flyers at churches and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And according to uh, Jesse's figures, we registered like 20,000 people that summer, which was a very significant number uh, because only like 100,000 people voted in those, in those days right. in, in the city of Atlanta. Uh, so that was that was a big deal that we had. So you uh, mentioned during so, so during this time too, you mentioned the Atlanta Daily World mm -hmm. being pretty much the only black newspaper in right. the city and was very conservative. Right. And then part of the outgrowth, as I understand it, of the student movement was a new newspaper, yes. which was the Atlanta Inquirer. Right. And that was started right as yeah. part of the movement. Yes, absolutely. Now uh, the the Atlanta Daily World which was a part of a little chain. There were like, I think maybe four different world papers uh, mm -hmm. in the South. I know there was a Birmingham world. Um, the one here was very conservative. Uh, C.A. Scott was died in the world conservative. He was the only black paper in the country who endorsed Nixon and Goldwater. I mean, oh you know, my. it was incredible. So in any event, he, he editorialized against our movement. Mm -hmm. And so what we were doing to get our word out, we, uh, we had a little flyer that we distributed at churches called uh, the student movement and you. Yep. And we went around to churches and put them on car windshields and, and all that sort of thing. And uh, and a guy named um, something Hill, not Jesse Hill. Kasuth Hill. Kasuth Hill. Had an office supply business. And, yep. and he, uh, he was a very fair skinned guy, black guy. And this was when uh, uh, we had an office over on Woven Avenue and he came into the office to see Lonnie and, uh, and whatever student lady who was serving secretary came back and told. Lonnie, there was a guy I didn't see him. And when this guy came back, Lonnie was frightened because he was wondering, who's this white man coming in here to mm -hmm. see me? And uh, he, put, he put Lonnie at ease by saying, I'm Pursuit Hill, and I own the Hill's office supply thing. So Lonnie realized, well, he must be black. So he offered to use his printing press to print a newspaper uh, for us. And he already had the name Atlanta Inquirer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we began publishing the, uh, the Atlanta Inquirer. Uh, J. Lo Aware uh, ended up. Um, printing the newspaper out of his garage for a good long while. And he later formed the Atlanta World, I mean the Atlanta Voice, which is still mm -hmm. in existence today, as is the Atlanta Inquirer. As Inquirer. Is the Inquirer. Yeah, the Inquirer became quite a powerful organ in this town. Uh, I became editor of the yep. Inquirer sometime later, when, mm -hmm. where I was for about three years. And um, during the, um, the mayor's race, uh, that involved Ivan Allen and Lester Maddox and four other guys, um, the community, the black community was really scattered on support of the different candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all supporting, they were supporting all of the candidates except Les right. Um Most of the uh, old guard was supporting um, Ivan Allen, but some of them were supporting um, Jim Aldrich, Milton Farris, Charlie Brown. Um, but the students for the most part and their young Turks were supporting a guy named M. M. Muggsy Smith. 
Now, Muggsy Smith was a guy in the state legislature who, in 1948, had introduced legislation to unmask the Klan. So, you know, in our minds, he was the most liberal of these mm -hmm. white male Anglo Saxon Protestants that, that were available to vote for. So the students lined up behind him. Uh, it took a lot of votes, you know, away from these other guys because of it. Uh, and what happened was we ended up with a runoff between Ivan Allen and Lester Mattis. Okay, but during the campaign, uh, the Atlanta Enquirer uh, ran editorials in support of Moses Smith and all that. And we have an editorial cartoonist named Maurice Pennington. He was superb. He had also done our picket signs for us. He worked at the Atlanta Life Insurance Company and ran their print shop and all that. Um, but his great editorial cartoonist, and he had done one cartoon that showed Ivan Allen and Vesta Mattis sharing a single suit of clothing. And the cut line said, cut from the same cloth. So the message was, there's no difference between these two guys, mm -hmm. all right? That was why we were trying to support somebody else. Right. All right, so when they kept going to a runoff, uh, in the minds of a lot of black people because of the newspaper and all, right. there's no difference between them, why should I bother, right? Mm -hmm. So, my friend Helen Bullock convinces Ivan that he needs to come and talk to me. So, he comes to my side of town we meet in the den of um, Ralph Long, uh, Carolyn Long Banks' father. Uh, and uh, it's just Ivan Allen and Helen Bullock, me and uh, two or three other students. And uh, Ivan came, came in very self-assured, you know, that uh, of course you're not gonna win this election uh, because black people ain't gonna vote for less than Maddox, <laughs> you know. So he says, like, why do we need him? And uh, I suggested to him that uh, we had a third option. And he said, what is that? I said, we could go fishing. And uh, so Helen says, I'm not Ivan. Maybe you ought to listen to what he's saying. I remember her exact words. And um, so I reminded him of that cartoon that was in the Atlanta Enquirer. And, uh, and the fact that a lot of people saw no difference between the two of them. And, and a lot of blacks wouldn't bother to vote. In which case, you're going to lose. You know, because uh, Lester Maddox had a sure 30% of the vote, without a doubt. Uh, and his people are going to turn out in large numbers. Uh, so if blacks don't vote in large numbers uh, for you, you, you lose the election. So he began to listen, and uh, I requested that he publicly commit to about half a dozen things. And uh, it was like desegregation of city hall and and all city facilities and employment of blacks in traditional positions and mm -hmm. you know I don't know what the list was exactly but he you know he objected for a while and Helen convinced him that he should listen and he agreed to do this and actually did it wow. he publicly committed to all these things and the payoff would be that we would encourage black people to go back to the polls mm -hmm. based on his distinguishing himself from the other guy but we would not endorse him uh, now Lonnie had endorsed Moses Smith but I thought that was inappropriate too uh, for our movement to be endorsing partisan candidates. So I said, we, we won't endorse you, but we will encourage blacks to go back to the polls and we know how they will vote mm -hmm. based on you making these public commitments. Yeah. And that's what happened and that's how you get elected. Wow. So that's one of the key things that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the inquirer did. Yeah. Another was um, we got a, um, a black policeman fired for police brutality. Uh, a guy, it happened over in, in Southwest Atlanta uh, there was like a 42-year-old mild-mannered black guy that this policeman had beat with a, uh, a, a police club thing or something like that, and you know, bruised him all up and, and all that. And so we made a crusade in the in the paper. Um, I, I wrote the editorials about it, and uh, John Dell Johnson, who later became quite famous as an NACP person, and we have a stretch of road name for her, um, wrote the, the uh, news articles for it, and we made a big campaign about it. So. That, that Herbert Jenkins, my friend, yeah. not really, the right. police uh, chief uh, invited us to come down and meet with him about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went down to meet him, and uh, so he asked that uh, this guy's file be brought in. And uh, in the file, the guy had three letters of reference. He was from North Georgia. He had a letter from the, the mayor of the little town, from the police chief and from the sheriff. Two of them said, He's from a very bad family, would not hire him under any circumstance. The third one said, he's from a very bad family, but maybe he's different. And so the chief says, how did this guy get hired in the first place? I said, that's a very good question, chief. Mm -hmm. So they fired the guy. 
Uh, but it was because of the campaign run by, by the Enquirer. Yep. Ivan Allen once said to me, um, well, I'll tell you why he said it first. Uh, uh, when blacks had begun to move into housing a little too far to the south, where whites were living, uh, and there was a big protest and uprising about white folk, but blacks trying to move in there. Uh, that Ivan Allen's solution was to put a, barri a barricade across, you know, the, the, the streets that led from one yeah. side to the other. Yeah. And uh, I sent a photographer out to take a picture of it. I ran it, you know, across the front page of the Enquirer, and I called it the Peyton Wall, because it was on Peyton Road. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became national news. It was all over the news, uh, all over everywhere. It was a great embarrassment to Ivan Allen. Mm -hmm. So he, he finally had to take this, this thing down. Hartsfield later said to him, Never make a mistake that can be photographed. <laughs> wow. I love that. So anyhow, uh, he had to take this thing down, and, yeah. and because we were, we were really a crusading newspaper. We, there was always some cause or something we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so I would, uh, sometime later, said to me, he said, "You know, the first thing I do every Thursday morning is read the Enquirer to see if I'm in trouble." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but another thing that I would said about our movement, he said, "The three greatest things uh, for the making of the Atlanta that we have today." It was one, the, the plan for progress, the Forward Atlanta campaign, and the Atlanta student movement. Now, the plan for progress was an agreement between the city and the county as to who would provide with, what services. Right. Okay, the county had health, and the city had police, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and the Forward Atlanta campaign was a campaign by the Chamber of Commerce to sell the city as the place to be, you know, mm -hmm. and it attracted a lot of uh, major corporations here, and our movement. And I haven't said those are the three most important things in the, in the making of the new, the new Atlanta. Wow. How about that? That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you also wanted to talk about the Broadcast Coalition and, yeah. and things that came out of all the struggle and all the work that the movement accomplished. Yeah. Well, there, there, there are a few. Well, before that, uh, you, you know of the Freedom Rides yes. that took place. A little known story is that that concept started with us. Yep. That Lonnie King guy, you know, he was always up something. December of 1960. Yes, right? yes, and the, uh, the Supreme Court had ruled against mm -hmm. uh, segregation and in interstate transportation. Okay. Uh, so Lonnie had his bright idea that we ought to test that ruling. And mm -hmm. what we did was to um, have students and, you know, and some adults, I guess, to travel to all the connecting states to Georgia so it would be interstate uh, mm -hmm. transportation. Uh, Otis Moss Jr. and I went to Aiken, South Carolina. We sat directly behind the bus driver, no problem and all that. We get to Athens, where it was our stop, our first stop there, and um, Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a 20 minute stop there, supposedly. After about five minutes, after we were in the waiting room, the white waiting room, uh, somebody made a phone call to somebody. And our bus was called early to leave. So we were hustled back onto the bus. And as soon as we we're on the bus and the door closes, we see three carloads of college age guys with baseball bats and sticks and all that sort of thing rushing into the waiting room looking for us. And uh, we were on the bus, so the bus driver pulls out and somebody tells him that we were on that bus. <coughs> so some these guys follow us for some unknown distance. Uh, you know, with one car going in front of the bus and slowing up. And, you know, the bus would go around, and they kept doing that for a good long while. And we arrived in uh, Aiken, South Carolina. It was uh, dusk to dark, and they had one of these little side filling station type bus depots. Mm -hmm. It was just closed. So uh, Otis and I are standing on the side of the road waiting for our, our car, just, just trailing us to come back. And it seemed like it was two years before that no, car got there. <laughs> but it was probably uh, no more, maybe 15 minutes. And we didn't know if those other cars were still right. following us and, and all that or not, so we were a bit afraid, but uh, nothing happened to us, I mean. Right. But in other places, uh, some students were arrested, some students were beaten. Mm -hmm. Well, it made national news, and the guy who was the head of uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, uh, James uh, Farmer, mm -hmm. yep. uh, called Lonnie to ask him about this, and uh, mm -hmm. so Lonnie explained to him what we had done and all that. And it was he who came up with the idea of the Freedom Rides, mm -hmm. based on what we had done. Yep. And that was the story of this little one. Yeah. Um, but after we were out of school, uh, Lonnie uh, and I and some others took over the Atlanta branch in ACP. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we packed it with new members and um, got Monty named uh, president and uh, Mars Dillett became executive uh, secretary. Now Mars was teaching French at Morehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, we got him out of the classroom into that job. And I told him at the time, I said, now Mars, you know, you gotta understand, this is a one-way street. You're probably never going back to the classroom. You're always gonna be doing some, something like this. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he never went back to the classroom. He did a lot of other great things. Yeah. Um, so while we, were, while we had the NACP, we formed uh, a broadcast coalition, mm -hmm. which included some other civil rights organizations and the NACP. And uh, again, we were challenging the licenses of the television stations in particular because there's a requirement that they have community input, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, for their license renewal, and all the license renewals were coming up. And I don't know if it was every five years, three years, or whatever, but they were coming up. So we, we challenged their licenses with the FCC. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this required them to sit down with us uh, and, and talk to us. I had, uh, I, Morris and I had uh, uh, Channel 5, I remember. And they brought in, like a dozen lawyers from Miami. Uh, there was a store broadcasting system, a company or whatever, that owned Channel 5 at the time. I don't know if they still do. Uh, so they brought this battery of lawyers in there, and the leaders of the station and my little team uh, were there, and we were insisting, you know, that they had to hire blacks in non-traditional positions, promote folk, put folk on the air, and all that. And they, uh, they kept us there for a long, long time. And we were hungry and thirsty and they didn't offer us any food or water. And later on it occurred to us that every one of them had left the room one at a time and came back licking their lips. So they had gone out to eat and left us in there starving and thirsty. But we were there for like five hours or so, but uh, we did in fact uh, negotiate. This. And that, that's how you got Monica Kaufman on the air. Right. Uh, and Josh Dorsey. Dorsey yep. yeah. And uh, Emmanuel Hall, mm -hmm. some other people like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we did at that time. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so fun days, you should have been here. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't born yet. Well, that's, that's no that's excuse. That's, that's no excuse. So yeah. I wanted to ask you, because you do a lot of work with students yes. now in 2018. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you, is for, for, for me, for my students, for the students mm -hmm. you interact with, what advice at, would you give students as a veteran of the civil rights struggle mm -hmm. to make civil rights movements continue to work. In to make America great again? Yeah. Oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah some orange here. Um, well, I, I have continued to meet with, uh, with students and uh, a group of them a few years ago put together a new appeal for human rights, yeah. as a matter of fact, right. uh, which was topical for the times. Uh, and if they were, or other students were doing such a thing today, uh, obviously, there will be some additional concerns or some magnification of old concerns mm -hmm. that still need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always say to students about a movement is that a movement is, by its nature, multidimensional, which to me means that it involves a deep commitment to lofty ideals on the part of a lot of people doing a lot of different things over a long period of time. And you know, I chat about our movement. You saw there were a lot of people doing a lot of different things, and yeah. including putting their houses up as collateral to be able to sell jail, mm -hmm. uh, and sitting on some richest credit, credit cards to put in the vault uh, to close their accounts with segregation over in California. Yeah. Uh, so, and people made sandwiches, they provided transportation, they made phone calls, and all that. Not everybody was sitting in and walking picket lines. Uh, so that's the message I always try to get across: that don't expect everybody to do every the same thing. Right. You know, they don't take the same level of risk or have the same commitment, or want to necessarily do the same thing that you're prepared to do. Right. But don't send them away if they support what you're trying to do. Uh, so that's one of the messages. And another is that, um, you know, citizens don't allow their friends to avoid registering and voting. Mm -hmm. And I suggested to some students a long time ago in the Atlanta University Center, you ought to make sure that every, and the, the, the presidents and the boards of these institutions should make sure that everybody on their campus, whether it's an administrator, faculty member, student, janitor, or whatever, is a registered voter. Mm -hmm. And they should have that peach on, mm -hmm. you know, at the election time, mm -hmm. to show that they've, uh, they've, uh, they've voted. And you can demand that. This is a, these are private institutions. Yeah. You know, it's not a state institution, you know, That's right. uh, but they're private institutions. If I were president of one of these schools, there would be nobody on my campus who was not registered to vote and voted. 
Yeah, it just wouldn't be. You know, that'd be a qualifying factor for a student, for a teacher, for everybody. Um, because if you don't vote, you don't count. That's right. And you, you, uh, you don't have a voice, you know. Uh, so that's extremely important. But it's also important to not wait to see who's going to run for office, but find people who deserve to be in office, mm -hmm. help to groom them and, and get them elected, mm -hmm. and watch them while they're in office to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's what democracy is all about. That's what a society does if it, if it prospers. Yeah. So that, among the things that I, I would say. The other thing is that I, that I think is extremely important, and, uh, and, and we made some reference to it. You gotta realize that not just your problems should be important to you, mm -hmm. but we are a total society of human beings. And you notice our document was called an appeal for human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, civil rights can be legislated in and out of existence. Mm -hmm. You know, but human rights are inherent in, a, in your being born as a human. Uh, and uh, some German philosopher a long time ago wrote something, and I can't remember exactly how it went, but they came for the Jews, and I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And they came for the workers and kind of stuff. And you can say the same thing today. They came for the undocumented uh, uh, folk, and I wasn't undocumented, so I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. They came for the gays, and I wasn't gay, so I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. They came for the immigrants at the border. Yeah. Or, you know, fleeing oppression and starvation, and I wasn't one of them, so I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, then they came for me, and there was nobody left to do anything. You know, because we are all bound together, as uh, Martin King said, in a, in a mutual bond of something, uh, uh, of mutuality. Yes. Uh, and um, what affects one affects the whole. That's right. And if you ever lose sight of that, you're going to be very selfish. The thing that I like most about our efforts were that it was selfless, you know. For the most part, hardly any of us were expecting anything out of it personally. Some folk ran for office later and, you know, some folk profiteered, you know, in, in various ways. Uh, but as a movement, it was a selfless movement. Mm -hmm. We were trying to do good for the whole. And uh, any movement should be that. Any person should be like that, you know. I, I got to be concerned about you because you're 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 bound to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Thank you very much for spending time with us today and sharing your experiences um, and your wisdom. Well, it's been a pleasure, and it's important that you guys are doing this. So, hooray for Kennesaw State! <laughs> hooray!